In this video, I'm gonna be upgrading the RAM on this first generation Apple TV. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, the first generation Apple TV was basically like a really cut down and very low powered Intel Macintosh, very early Intel Macintosh. Um, as you can see here, it's early enough that it still uses an IDE hard disk. Um, but the specifications on the machine were not very good at all. Um, the CPU in these machines is a one gigahertz Pentium M based CPU. Um, it's not classified technically as a Pentium M. It's like a really small package and it's just a really low power uh, Pentium M CPU basically. Um, but the rest of the machine is basically a standard Intel system. Um, and it also does have dedicated graphics, uh, specifically an NVIDIA GeForce Go 7300 video card. Now, the biggest downfall to these is while it's probably enough for the stock operating system that these machines run, um, they only came with 256 megabytes of system memory from the factory. And of course, there was never any options on that because it, it's just an Apple TV. Um, so it was only ever available with 256 megabytes of system memory installed. Now with that, in this video, my goal is to upgrade this machine from its original 256 megabytes to one gigabyte of system memory. Now, I know that doesn't seem like all that much in the grand scheme of things, um, but it is four times the memory that's currently in there, and due to the way the memory is configured in this machine, is the maximum possible with the chips available uh, to install in this machine. And I'll give you more details on that later once I take the board out of the machine. Um, but as you can see here, I've already taken it all apart here, and that was just so I could put this hard disk in here, which actually contains a copy of macOS 10.5 Leopard. So as you can see here, I've got it already booted up, and uh, we can go ahead and take a look at the system. So as you can see here, it has a one gigahertz CPU, as I mentioned, and OS 10 reports it as unknown. Um, it has 256 megabytes of 667 megahertz DDR2 memory. And if we go over to System Profiler here, we can take a closer look. As you can see here, interestingly enough, it detects it as a Mac Pro 3,1. So I did find that quite interesting. Of course, 256 megabytes of memory. And if we head over to the memory tab here, oh, well, that's interesting. It actually has two channels in the machine, uh, but one of them isn't even being used. I wonder if I could figure out how to use that. Unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna be possible because the um, pin out on the board or the, the fan out on the board doesn't include any pins for that second channel. Um, so I'm probably not gonna be able to use that, but I should be able to upgrade this single channel here to one gigabyte of system memory. So that is the goal, as I mentioned, for today's video. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead into graphics displays here and show you that as well. As you can see, it's a GeForce Go 7300. And interestingly enough here, it's only using two PCIe lanes, so that's also quite interesting. Um, just another thing to show you how low power this machine actually is. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing taken apart, get the board on my board preheater here, and we'll begin the process of removing the original chips to prepare to install the new chips. So I'll go ahead and get that disassembled and resume the video. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the Apple TV completely disassembled, and now we can go ahead and take a look at it real quick here. Um, so right here is the tiny little CPU. Um, like I said, this is that one gigahertz Pentium M-based CPU. Very small package, as you can see. Um, over here, we've got the uh, GPU, the NVIDIA GeForce Go 7300. Once again, another little tiny chip and uh, the main uh, chipset right here. Um, so yeah, that's all the chips on the board. And then of course the RAM itself are just these four chips right here. And that is indeed why I can't upgrade this past one gigabyte uh, because it only has four chips. And the biggest chips I can get uh, in DDR2 are um, only 256 megabytes a piece, or I believe that's two gigabit chips. So four of those will equal exactly one gigabyte, of course. And that, of course, is the maximum I can install. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the other side of the board real quick here. Um, I just want to point out one other thing I noticed. Um, if you take a look right here, you can see that that is an I2C EEPROM, more than likely used as the SPD EEPROM for the onboard system memory. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos on RAM upgrades, uh, you'll know that 
in more modern machines, Apple puts the SPD data inside the main system ROM, which on this machine is right there, of course. Um, but it looks like this one is so early that either they didn't know how to do it back then or the BIOS simply doesn't support it. Um, but they did indeed have to use an external SPD EEPROM uh, right here, which we can of course dump and then reprogram as necessary for our newly installed memory. So of course we'll get to that later after we install the new chips, but for now I'm going to go ahead and get the board on the board preheater, uh, get it heating up, and then we'll begin the process of removing each of the four memory chips. Alright, so as you can see here I've gotten the board and the board preheater now, so we can go ahead and begin the process of removing the original chips. Now of course the first thing we want to do is just apply some flux to each one, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. All right, and now that flux has been applied to each chip, we can go ahead and begin the process of desoldering each one. Alright, and as you can see there, we have removed all four of the existing memory chips. So from there, we just need to take uh, some soldering iron, or the soldering iron and some solder wick, and clean all the residual solder off of the pads. Alright, so in order to do that, the first thing we're going to do is just apply some fresh leaded solder to each of the pads. Just like so. And now that we've done that, we can just go back over them again with some solder wick to remove all of the residual solder. All right, and now with all of the pads completely clean, with all the residual solder removed, we'll just go over them one more time with a paper towel with some rubbing alcohol to remove all of the old flux. And that's it. So the pads are now prepared for our new chips. Um, and I've actually got our new chips already. Now, unlike the previous videos I've done, um, I'm not going to be salvaging them from a, another module, like a soda module or something like that. Um, and that's just because I couldn't find them, or I couldn't find any soda modules with the necessary chips that I needed. Um, so I've got all four new chips right here. Um, I did have to get these uh, from China, so they did take quite some time to get here, um, but I do have all eight new memory chips here. And uh, I'll go ahead and show you one of them right here. You can see the uh, part number on it right there. Let's see if I can focus in. So yeah, D9MTD is the FPGA or FBGA code on these. Um, there's actually a site on a, mic or a page on Micron's website that you can use to look up uh, the actual part number for these. Uh, but I've got four of them right here. And we'll just prepare them to be soldered onto the board. So in order to do that, we just need to apply flux to each one. So I'll go ahead and move the board out of the way here. Flip these all over here. And we'll apply some flux to each. And with the flux on each chip, we're just gonna heat each one up so the flux flows into place. And we wanna make sure it covers every ball on the chip.
All right, and now with flux applied to each chip, we'll go ahead and heat the board up one more time there and apply a little bit of flux to the board itself as well. All right, and now that flux has been applied to the board, we'll just go ahead and take each chip and align it to the pads on the board. So I'm just gonna go ahead and place each one in its general location first. And then from there, we will go ahead and fully align them into position. All right, and now with each chip in its general location, we'll just go ahead and align it to the silkscreen outline. Now, it is obvious that uh, these new chips are actually quite a bit physically smaller um, than the chips we took off of the board. So it is gonna be a little bit more tricky to get them aligned properly, but nothing too bad here. And you do have a little bit of room for error um, because the chips will kind of suck themselves into position um, as long as the balls are in their general pad location. But as you can see, it is quite a bit tedious to get them quite aligned. Okay, and that looks just about good there. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the hot air warming up once again, and then we'll begin the process of soldering each chip into position. All right, so all four chips look to be soldered on successfully. So I'm gonna go ahead and let the board cool down and we'll go ahead and take a closer look at the chips. All right, so as you can see here, all the chips have soldered on successfully. Uh, if you go ahead and take a look at the side of them there, you can see all the chips look uniform with their spacing to the board and all the balls underneath them look perfectly level as well. Um, so that's what you wanna look for. And when you're actually soldering, you want to look for each one or look carefully at each one and you'll actually see the chip uh, slightly drop towards the board. And uh, that will indicate that the that all the solder balls have melted and, then the, and that the chip has been successfully soldered to the board. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get this board uh, flipped over and then we'll desolder that potential SPD EEPROM. I don't actually know for sure if it's, S, if it's SPD data. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and desolder it, dump it, and see if it is. And then from there, um, if it is, we'll just modify it. If not, we'll dump the main system ROM and see if there's any SPD data in there. Uh, but by the looks of it, that I squared C EEPROM is mo almost certainly the SPD data for this memory. So I'm going to go ahead and flip the board back over, get the camera back in the tripod, and then we'll desolder that SPD EEPROM. All right, so as you can see here, that SPD EEPROM is located right there. Um, so the first thing, of course, we're gonna do is just apply some flux to it. And now that the flux has been applied, we'll just go ahead and use the hot air to remove it. So as you can see, I've gotten the uh, SPD EEPROM successfully removed there. Um, so while I've got that off, um, I'm going to go ahead and apply some fresh leaded solder to these pads. Um, that way it's a little bit easier to solder uh, when we go to put it back on later. Alright, so now we've gotten some nice fresh uh, leaded solder on there. Um, the next thing we need to do is solder that SPD EEPROM onto my little uh, adapter here, um, which as you can see has the correct pads for it right there. Uh, and then that will allow me to use it with the EEPROM programmer. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get that in position. We'll solder the uh, SPD EEPROM on that. And then from there, we can go ahead and dump it. All right, so I've gotten the little board ready to be soldered on. So we'll go ahead 
and simply place the EEPROM onto it and then solder it on. Okay, and the EEPROM is now soldered onto the board. Uh, so now what we're gonna do is just go ahead and put this board in the EEPROM programmer, dump the chip, and see what we need to modify in the SPD data. All right, so I took a look at the EEPROM after I desoldered it from the board, and it looks like that's actually not an SPD EEPROM. Um, it's actually a uh, microwire-based EEPROM, which is interesting. I've never seen one of those before. Um, but if I had to guess, it's probably something for uh, the network hardware right here instead. Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do now is just desolder the main system SPI ROM, and then that will for sure have um, the SPD data in it that we need to change. So let's go ahead and get it desoldered here. It is a little close to this uh, IDE connector here. Um, hopefully I don't melt it, uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, see what happens here. Alright, so as you can see I've gotten the EEPROM removed, and uh, just like with the other one, I'm going to go ahead and um, apply some fresh leaded solder to the pads. Uh, that way it's just a little bit easier to solder back on once we're done here. Alright, and that should be good right there. I'm not going to bother wicking the pads or anything this time. It'll just solder on, uh, no issue. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get the EEPROM cleaned up, put it in the uh, adapter needed for the EEPROM programmer, dump it, and then modify the SPD info. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the system's SPI ROM in the adapter here and installed it into the EEPROM programmer. Um, so now we're going to go ahead over to the EEPROM programmer software. Uh, we're going to do select ICs, 25 flash detect, it should detect it right there, so let me just go ahead and select the correct one, which is an SST25FV016B. Select, and we'll go ahead and read the contents. Alright, so now that the chip has been read, we'll just go ahead and save this. Save it to the desktop as ATV11.bin. Okay, so there we go. So now we'll go ahead and open a hex editor here. We'll select ATV11.bin. And now what we need to do is locate uh, the potential SPD data inside this SPI ROM. So in order to do that, I'm gonna go ahead over to the DDR2 SODIM or SDIM SPD definition spec here. Um, I will put a link to this in the video description if you're interested in taking a look at it yourself. Um, so we have a few options here. Um, so for byte 0, either 80 or FF for 128 or 256 byte. Uh, we'll assume 80 for right now. I've seen that very commonly. Um, we'll assume it's using a 128 byte EEPROM as well. So that would be 8007. And that has to be 08. And then we'll just have to try each of these four options. So we have a little bit to search for here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and search for each thing off camera real quick. Um, and locate the SPD data and uh, show you exactly what I found. Alright, so as you can see here, I have located the data in the system's SPI ROM, the SPD data of course, and as you can see here, it matches the specification exactly. So you can see it's 800808-0D-0A, um, so you can see 80, 128 bytes of data, 08, a 256 byte EEPROM, of course, it's not really an EEPROM, but it still has to match the specification. Uh, 08 for DDR2 SD RAM, 0D for 13 rows, and 0A for 10 columns. So of course, that's all data we're gonna have to change in order to match the specification of the new chips we installed. Um, so in order to do that more easily, there's actually a tool called SPD Tool, uh, which is a Windows application where you can load an SPD dump 
and actually view it in a more human-friendly way, um, which would allow you to edit it more easily. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get the 256 bytes according to the data here, or yeah, 256 bytes, like I said, uh, with the 08 specification there for a 256 byte EEPROM. Uh, we'll go ahead and dump these 256 bytes after this section to a separate file. That way we can load it into the SPD tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get all that done. And from there, we'll open it and see what we need to edit to match the chips that we just installed. Now, as you've seen in my last video, um, I simply used the SPD data from the SODEMs I took the chips off of. Uh, but in the case of this system, I can't do that because A, um, there are no SODEMs with only four chips in this size, at least that I was able to find. Um, and like I said, I don't even have a SODEM at all to reference. Um, so I'm just going to have to go off the data sheet for the chips I installed, um, as well as the board configuration to set the data accordingly. So I'm going to go ahead and get a copy of SPD tool, um, extract this 256 bytes of data to a file, and edit the data from there. All right, so I've gone ahead and taken a look through all this data here, and I think I figured out exactly what we need to change here. Um, so the things we need to change in the SPD data are the number of row addresses, the number of column addresses, um, the number of dim ranks should be able to stay the same as we're only using one rank, uh, so four chips. Um, and if we go down here, I forget exactly where it is, but there's one other thing we need to change, and that is the rank density. Let's see if I can find that here. Should be this byte there. Yeah, module rank density, as you can see, it's set to 256 megabytes, where of course now it is one gigabyte with the new chips we installed. Um, so I've gone ahead and pulled up the data sheet, sheet here for the uh, the original chips that are on the board, uh, which are 512 megabits. And if we go ahead and do 512 um, divided by eight, that's 64 megabytes a piece times four, you can see that gives us 256 megabytes, and that's of course for the original chips. Now our new chips are two gigabit, so 2048 divided by eight, which is 256 megabytes a piece, times eight, or times four rather, four chips, that gives us a total of one gigabyte of system memory. Um, so that all matches up. You can see the data sheet for our new chips here are two gigabit, and uh, these both, of course, are in the by 16 configuration. So in the case of the new chips, they're 128 meg by 16, and the old chips are 32 meg by 16. So this is the set of data here we're gonna need to know for the row addresses and column addresses here. And it's just an address count, so basically the number of lines. So you can see this is A0 through A12, so 13 uh, row address lines there, and column address A0 through A9, which is 10 uh, lines there. So if we go ahead and take a look back at our SPD data once again, you can see number of row addresses set to 13, number of column addresses set to 10. So we'll just have to set those to match our new chips here. So you can see that our new chips in the by 16 configuration have 14 lines instead of 13. So we just have to set that to 14. And for the number of column addresses, we need to set that to correspond to this, which is actually the same. It's still nine through zero, so 10 lines. So that does not need to change. So literally the only things we need to change are the row addresses. And of course, down here, um, we might need to change the data width. I'll have to check that out. I don't think that'll be a problem. Let me check the data sheet here real quick. That I'll have to check out as well. I might need to change that. Um, but for now, let me just go ahead and change the rank density to one gigabyte. So now that's set correctly. And I'm gonna go through and change uh, that data width if I need to. I might not need to, that just might be the 
the bit width. I don't think that needs to be changed, but I'll, I'll go through and check that just to make sure. Uh, but if not, uh, that should be all we need to change there. The rest of it's just uh, the voltage, the timing, and the physical size of the module itself, which obviously doesn't even matter for this style onboard memory configuration. So yeah, everything looks good. Uh, Micron is set. Um, all that stuff is set. Not that this stuff even matters at all. But yeah, um, everything looks pretty good there. Um, but I'm going to go ahead, like I said, and just check this out, change it if need be, and then we'll be able to flash this modified SPD data back onto the machine and see if it boots. So I'm going to go ahead and get everything uh, modified here, and then I'll show you the process of actually modifying the data in the SPD EEPROM and then flashing it back onto the chip. All right, so I had another look at uh, this SPD info uh, website that I found here, and there was one other thing I did need to change. I did not need to change the data width. Uh, that was 64-bit as expected, um, but I do, I do need to change the number of banks on SD RAM device um, because the original chips, which were 512 megabit chips, only had four internal banks, and we can actually take a look at the data sheet and see that here. Here's the original chips. You can see the bank address here, four internal banks right there, and the new chips, bank address eight. So we have eight internal banks on those chips. Um, so we will need to change the number of banks on SD RAM device as well to, of course, eight. So that's all set now. Um, we've changed everything. So to recap here, we've changed number of addresses, 14 from 13, number of banks, and then the last thing we've changed is the bank density, which I might actually have to edit uh, once again because there's... Well, actually, no, I shouldn't have to because that was the representation of the full amount of memory. So yeah, module rank density, so that would be one gigabyte. So yeah, that's all set correctly now, um, so we should be good to flash this onto the SPI, SPI ROM. All right, so now that we've gotten the SPD data modified to our liking, um, now what we need to do is modify the actual SPI ROM uh, with that new SPD data. So let me just go ahead and select it here. So this is our uh, SPI ROM right here. Um, so the next thing we need to do is just search for the SPD data, um, and we'll just use 08 or 800808 to find it. Hex pattern. 0808 and as you can see it found it right there it's only in one section um, we'll go ahead and right click on that select extract body um, then all right and now that we've extracted that we can open it up in the hex editor here So here's our section with the SPD data. Let's find it again. Okay, so here is our SPD data. And I've also saved um, the changed SPD from SPD tool. Um, so we'll just have to copy all this. And this is the edited SPD for one gigabyte of system memory. Um, and go to where it is here and select paste write. And that should overwrite the SPD data with our modified SPD data. Um, so with that all set, we'll go ahead and save that. Go back into UEFI tool, select right click on the part we just extracted, select replace body, and then select the modified file right there. So as you can see, it's all set to rebuild the file and replace that section. So now we'll save the image file we will save it as ATV11 modded.bin and just say yes to reopen reconstructed file. Um, so that's all ready to go now. Um, so now let's just go ahead back to the EEPROM programming tool, load the dump we just saved. So in that case, it is ATV11 modded.bin and select program. This is quite a slow EEPROM, it seems, so it's going to take quite some time to program. 
Uh, so we'll just let this program and then from there we can go ahead and solder the chip back onto the board and see if it boots. Alrighty, so I've gotten our chip ready to be re-soldered onto the board. So we'll go ahead and wait for the hot air to finish warming up here and solder it on. Alright, so as you can see the EEPROM has now been re-soldered on successfully. Um, so now we'll just go ahead and get the machine all reassembled, plug it in and see if it boots. All right, so I tested the machine and unfortunately I could not get it to work no matter what I tried. Um, I did try some uh, modifying the SPD data further and making sure all the timings in it were correct based on the data sheet for these specific chips that I installed and nothing I do would get it to boot. Um, and then I thought about it a little further and I remembered something that I've seen on some MacBook Air logic boards and that is for some reason Apple arbitrarily decides not to route one of the address lines that's not needed on the smaller size chips. Um, in the case of the MacBook Airs, it's address line 15 on the X8 chips that they use. Uh, but on these machines, um, the one or the uh, two gigabit chips, which I installed here, need address line 13 on the board in order to function properly. Now, this platform, um, the Intel 945GU chipset that this machine uses, does support address line 13 so I assumed it would be there and connected to each chip um, but unfortunately that seems to be not the case um, so as you can see here I desoldered the chip and I've also desoldered one of the RAM chips um, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you what I found now so if we go over here over here and look at the data sheet for one of these chips you can see address line 13 is right down there at the very bottom so if we take a look at the board here, we match up um, where address line 13 is supposed to be, which would be, um, let me get my tweezers in here, should be right there. So that pad right here should be address line 13. Um, but if we go ahead and take a really close look at it here, you can see that there is no trace connected to that pad at all. Now there are three other pads that could potentially be our issue here, and those are these three pads um, right in here. So if you take a look here, these three pads right here are for bank select. Now another difference between these two chips is the original chips only used bank select 0 and 1 because they only had four banks, uh, but these chips have eight banks so they require all three lines, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, but as you can see there, all three of those are connected properly, um, so that's not an issue. It's simply this address line 15 located right here that's causing our problem. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to manually connect address line 15 of each of these four chips to the correct pin on the Northridge chip here. Um, so of course in order to do that um, we're going to have to use a uh, bodge wire um, so i'm going to have to connect one bodge wire to the correct pin on this chip which i'll have to find based on the data sheet connect it to each of the four chips and then connect it to a pull-up resistor um, to the main ddr power rail and these little resistor packs right here you can see one there 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 and there um, i think there's a few more somewhere around here i think yeah, two more up here. So you can see there's quite a few of these um, resistor packs here. And we need to find one of these that has a pin that's not being used by anything. And I believe this one does. So if we go ahead and take a look closely at this, you can see, actually that one looks like it has all four, but this one lower one right here, this one, this pin up in this corner, looks like it's not connected to anything. Um, so I am going to desolder that and verify that, uh, but if that pin's not connected to anything, we can use that as the pull-up for address line 13 for each of these chips. So it's all one line that connects to each um, because they are all on one bank, so <clears throat> the same address line will connect to all of them. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get the Northbridge reballed. I'm just going to go ahead and do that off camera because it's going to be kind of a pain. Um, you can see here's what the Northbridge looks like. 
Um, yeah, the ball density is um, pretty good on that one. There's some small balls and they're very close together. Um, I don't even know if I have a stencil for that chip, but hopefully um, I can find one and at least make something work. Uh, but once I get that reballed, I'm going to figure out which pin to connect wires to on here, or a wire to. Connect that wire, solder the chip onto the board, and then connect that wire to each chip and then to the pull-up resistor. So of course I will have to go through and reball all these chips again, uh, but that shouldn't be a big deal, at least compared to this Northbridge chip here. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get this chip reballed, um, and then from there we'll begin the process of getting the wires installed and soldering everything back on. Alrighty, so as you can see here, I have successfully reballed the Northbridge chip here, and it's now ready to be re-soldered back onto the board. Now, I did some probing with the multimeter and continuity mode um, to see if I could find a point on the board where this address line 13 might be fanned out to, and it actually is fanned out, um, and let me uh, point it out to you here. Um, so it's the seventh ball over on this bottom row, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so right there that ball right there and if you look really close at it you're not going to really be able to see it um, in the camera here um, but let's see if I can zoom in enough so you can yeah I don't know if you can make that out but there's actually a via in that pad right there so they actually did via it out and I found out where they via it out too um, if you go ahead and look here this probe point right right here is actually address line 13. Now this of course is the only point where address line 13 is available, um, but it's better than having to solder a wire um, to one of the pins on this BGA chip. Um, so instead I can just solder a wire here instead and then connect that to the eight chips or the four chips on the other side of the board. So that makes my life a little bit easier there. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and get this chip soldered on. I'm gonna just do that off camera and then I'll be able to desolder and reball all of these uh, RAM chips. As you can see, I've already desoldered one like I showed you before, uh, but I'll desolder the other three, uh, reball them, and then I'll begin the process of applying the wire um, to each of the uh, address line 13 pads on each chip. Alrighty, so as you can see here, I've gotten the address line 13 wire all connected here. Um, so the way it works is it runs from the other side of the board right here, connected to that probe point, which I previously determined based on continuity testing to the pads of the Northbridge here, that that is indeed address line 15 that they via'd out to the bottom of the board here. Um, so that wire just runs around the board and connects to pin or the address line 13 pin of each memory chip, as you can see right there. So I just kind of took it and uh, looped it over, looped it, on each one, therefore creating sort of like a kind of pad. Um, and then I just used a tiny, tiny amount of solder to tack it down to the pad so it wouldn't move around uh, while I was soldering. Um, now my only concern here is that the uh, wires might try to move around while I'm actually soldering the chips on, uh, but I'll take a really close look uh, as I'm soldering and make sure that does not happen. Um, and then of course the last connection here is to that one unused pin of that termination uh, resistor pack there. Um, so that will uh, be the pull-up. It's actually technically a pull-up line uh, for uh, the address line fifth or address 13 line right there. Um, so that is indeed wired correctly. Uh, that's how DDR2 is supposed to be wired in pretty much any memory type for that matter. Um, so now I'm just going to go ahead and solder the chips on once again and see if I can do so without the wire moving around on me. Alright, so as you can see here, I've gotten all four chips reballed and soldered onto the board. Um, so now what we can go ahead and do is just put the board back in its chassis, um, connect the power supply and everything else that's needed to power the board on, and give it a test. Now obviously before I already programmed the SPD info correctly, so hopefully it should just fire right up. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the board all hooked up and we will give it a test. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the logic board reinstalled into the Apple TV chassis here. 
Um, I've also applied a thermal pit or a thermal pad to the GPU and CPU right here. Of course, they are on the underside of the board. However, unfortunately, I could not get the machine to boot and detect all one gigabyte of installed system memory. Um, so unfortunately, it seems as though this platform simply just doesn't support chips of this high density in this configuration. Um, so the uh, two gigabit chips in X16 configuration. So of course there's four chips, so they have to be by 16 in order to get one 64-bit rank. So that's how uh, the memory chips are installed there. And unfortunately it just seems that this particular flat platform does not support that configuration. However, with that said, I was able to get it to work with 512 megabytes of system memory detected just by setting the number of row addresses to 13 in the SPD info, and that works perfectly fine and is perfectly stable as well. Now, one weird thing I found when I did this test is this wire that I installed for address line 13 actually still has to be there uh, for the machine to boot up at all uh, with the chips or with only detecting 512 megabytes of memory even though the chips installed are one or two gigabits in size or um, I guess uh, 256 megabytes a piece um, so yeah that's quite weird um, but I'm kind of glad that's the case because that means I didn't waste uh, all that time uh, running those wires and rebuilding the chips um, to have it be unnecessary um, now one thing I did add here if you can see right there, I added a 22 ohm resistor to that probe point right there, and that was just to match these resistor packs right here, uh, which are for each of the data lines. So I figured that could be a potential issue, um, so I added that resistor, and unfortunately it didn't really make any difference at all. Um, there's also the chance that it just doesn't work because this line is not impedance matched with the rest of them, which is kind of an important thing with DDR memory like this, but I didn't think it would be, uh, you know, a huge deal with just one line. But I might be wrong, or more more than likely, it's just that the platform doesn't support um, uh, two gigabits in a by 16 configuration like this. So, unfortunately, we're only going to be able to utilize 512 megabytes of the installed system memory. Uh, but luckily, with that all installed and this wire mod installed and the SPD info set correctly, it does indeed work perfectly fine and is perfectly stable with 512 megabytes of system memory detected. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and plug the machine in and let it boot up. You can see the power LED is flashing there, which indicates the machine is booting. So let's go ahead and take a look at the display. And as you can see, it has detected a signal from the machine. So any second now, it should show the OS X boot screen. All right, and as you can see there, it is now booting into OS X. So we'll just go ahead and let this boot and see how it works. Alrighty, so OS X has successfully booted here. Let's go ahead and ignore that. That's just due to the way the drive is formatted. Um, but yeah, here we are on a Mac OS Leopard desktop. So let's go ahead into About This Mac and check out the results here. So as you can see there, it's a one gigahertz unknown CPU. Once again, it's that Pentium M based uh, CPU that these use. And of course, the 512 megabytes of 667 megahertz DDR2 memory detected. Now, unfortunately, like I said, I'm kind of uh, disappointed that I could not get one gigabyte of system memory working, but 512 megabytes is double what it had originally, and it actually runs pretty well under Leopard even with only 512 megabytes installed. So as you can see here in the memory section of System Profiler, it detects the 512 megs installed in the first bank there, or first slot rather, I guess, channel A is what you could call it, and of course nothing in that slot because the platform, this Intel 82945GU chipset, doesn't actually have pins at all for a second memory channel. So I guess the channel is still there on the die, but 
There's no way to make use of it, even if you were to run a bunch of bodge wires. So I did find that quite interesting. Uh, but OS X actually runs quite well on this machine. It has full graphics acceleration, as you can see. It's got the translucent menu bar, full core image and quartz extreme support. So it's actually not a bad machine now with 512 megs of RAM uh, to run OS X on. It actually is pretty snappy. Uh, so to finish it off here, let's just go into Activity Monitor and to see what our memory usage is looking like here. So yeah, I mean, we're more than half free there, so it's definitely better than it was with 256 megs where it was basically all used with no applications running at all. Of course, it is still going to be kind of slow to use as, a, as an actual machine, but it's still going to be much better than it would be stock with the, five, or with the 256 megs of RAM. So with that, that has been the successful, well, partially successful upgrade of the system memory on a first-generation Apple TV. So, I hope you enjoyed this video.